I'm Reverend Dr. Antonia Lucic Gonzalez. Welcome to my Gal Pastor channel. Let's get right into our topic, shall we? I was this years old when I first really thought about this subject. Was Jesus naked on that cross and what would that mean? Why does the mere thought of that make me so uneasy? Because the divinity and nudity do not mix. Bringing the two together in our imagination seems so jarringly inappropriate. One, divinity overflows with every superlative and represents the fullness of dignity. The other, nudity, is elementary and in certain contexts infused with debasement, shame, and even abhorrent violence. In order to try and answer whether the two met on the cross, we'll back up a little and talk about the crucifixion first. So buckle up, this might hurt a bit. Earliest crucifixions were probably practiced under the Persians who dominated the Near East from the 6th through 4th century before Common Era. The Persians also practiced impaling as a mode of public execution, which dates back much further to the early 2nd millennium BC. You don't need to know all the history, except that crucifixion existed for a long time before the Romans. It had many purposes in the ancient world, on top of the obvious one, ending a life. Different peoples developed their own specific practices related to crucifixion and added their own meaning onto it. For some of the nomadic peoples, crucif crucifying had religious significance. For others, such as Assyrians, Persians, and Macedonians, it served to make an example of rebellious peoples. Carthagians used it as a method of motivating their generals by punishing those who made bad battle decisions. In the Roman Empire, crucifixion was used exclusively on slaves and rebels. Roman citizens were rarely condemned to death, possibly only in case of military treason, and then not by crucifixion. The subject was sort of a taboo in Roman culture. Cicero, a Roman statesman and philosopher who lived in the first century BCE, suggested that the very mention of the cross should be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, his ears. It is a crime, Cicero wrote, to bind a Roman citizen. To scourge him is a wickedness to put him to death is almost parasite. What shall I say of crucifying him, he said. I had to look up parasite. Not a native English speaker here. Killing of a parent or a close relative. The prevailing view was that the status of Roman citizenry was utterly incompatible with such a manner of death. The purpose of crucifixion in the Roman Empire was to maintain law and order. According to Roman law, if a slave killed his or her master, all of that master's slaves would be crucified as punishment. So when a first century Roman senator, Lucius Secundus, was murdered by a slave, Roman historian Tacitus wrote that some in the Senate tried to prevent mass execution of 400 of his slaves because there were so many women and children. But in the end, they were all crucified. Mass crucifixions followed the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE. Josephus testifies that in the aftermath of that Jewish rebellion, the Romans crucified people all over the walls of Jerusalem. The point of Roman crucifixion was not just taking a life of the person who broke the law. Further meaning was given to the process. The mere sentencing to such death meant that the person's value was not equal to the privileged class of Romans. And from then on, what was implemented in the process was a certain gradation of degradation. At the end of the degradation, by design, the dying person was completely stripped off of all that being human would have afforded her. Crucifixion was typically carried out by specialized teams consisting of a commanding centurion and his soldiers who pretty much had no limit imposed on them, no restrictions on cruelty, complete freedom in designing the process of this degradation. 
Still, there were some elements that were standards. Initially, the condemned would be stripped naked and scourged or flogged. Then they would carry the horizontal beam to the place of execution. The vertical beams were usually left in place. They would be led through the crowded streets bearing a titulus, a signboard proclaiming the person's name and crime. Upon arrival at the place of execution, the convicted would be stripped of any remaining clothing, then naked, nailed, or tied to the cross, when various other forms of abuse would take place. Mockery, taunting, deprivation, breaking of bones, more beatings, and such. The Roman soldiers would amuse themselves by crucifying criminals in different horrific positions. With crosses being only around six feet tall and at the eye level, the passers-by would sometimes participate in verbal and or physical abuse. The purpose of this punishment was fulfilled not solely by killing the person, but also by mutilating and dishonoring the body to the max. The complete loss of control over one's body equaled the loss of status and honor. For anyone observing this, such horrific demise would be a strong warning never to do anything against the ruling Romans to get oneself up on that tree. Did the gradation of degradation bottom out at the moment, moment of death? No. Dead bodies were frequently left on the crosses, picked at by birds or other animals. Denying an honorable burial amplified the degradation, thereby solidifying the meaning. It was a thorough system, excruciating in every way, crosses at the root of that word. What began as an already downgraded human, slave or conquered, ended much lower, a completely degraded criminal who, who physically lost his very form with his mangled body, who psychologically lost any control or dignity that he had possessed. Socially, complete isolation was affected. Every discernible indication of status or human cooperation, camaraderie, connection, or compassion was taken away. It was a complete stripping down of personhood to nothing. With this background in mind, we'll focus on our topic of interest. Nudity itself has been used in punishment throughout history. As one scholar noted, peoples defeated in wars often had their clothing taken away to shame them. In various parts of the world, slaves were not given clothing freely but had to earn it as reward for good service. Even in Puritan New England, condemned individuals would be stripped naked, have hot tar poured all over them, be coated with feathers, and then paraded around town in that state before being exiled out of the town. There is little question that the standard procedure under the Roman rule in the first century was to crucify persons completely nude. Moreover, to strip them fully and walk them to the place of execution unclothed. Seneca, who lived during the first century, described some horrific things that some executioners did to their victims that could only be done by exploiting one's nakedness. Some scholars do suggest, however, that in certain cases the Romans would have shown consideration for the customs of the people they conquered. Jewish commentaries on the law and scripture, both Mishnah and Midrash, declared being punished naked in the public place one of the most shameful things in the world. Therefore, some scholars contend that in respect for the Jewish view of nudity, some argued that Roman executioners might have allowed for a minimal modesty of a loincloth. What about the biblical witness? Can we make any conclusions about Jesus from the text themselves? Can Psalm 22, the most elaborate foreshadowing of Jesus' suffering on the cross, shed light on the question whether Jesus would, was crucified clothed or not? There we read, 
all my joints are on display and all my bones are on display while they gaze at me and gloat. That would certainly indica indicate complete exposure. Many verses of that psalm describe exactly things that happened to Jesus during crucifixion. Nevertheless, we have to exercise interpretive caution when attempting to read poetic and prophetic genres, literally. What do the Gospels tell us? Two of the Gospel Passion narratives report that the soldiers stripped Jesus during the trial and that for some period of time, the soldiers put on him a purple garment and a crown as they began the process of degradation by exploiting his vulnerability. But then they dressed him back into his clothes. Some scholars think that this was all the concession that the Jews were going to get for their abhorrence of public nudity, no naked parading. It is only after their arrival to the place of the crucifixion that we are told by all four gospel writers that the soldiers once again stripped him and proceeded to divide his clothes and cast lots for the garment that could not be torn. Here, we could rightly understand that there was no clothing left on Jesus. But the Gospels do not spell that out clearly for us. Where else can we go? Perhaps to other historically close sources. Most likely every artwork you've seen depicting Jesus in an attempt to preserve his dignity or out of concern for modesty presented him covered. But the first three known portrayals of Jesus crucified appear to have him without clothes. And I'll link in my description where you can see all three. The first, the oldest surviving art depicting him etched in an oval gem, probably worn on someone's ring, crafted more than a century after the crucifixion shows Jesus tied to a cross naked. Another second century depiction unearthed in Romania, also on a gem, shows a nude contorted crucified figure. The third is a graffito, carved into a, the wall, dating around year 200, depicting a naked human body with a head of a donkey hanging on the cross and a person in front of it raising his hand. The inscription, meant as a satire and ridicule of Christians in the Greek, reads, Alexamenos worships his God. All three of these early portrayals show Jesus without any clothes. Finally, I am wondering if the superb, very detailed scholarship of Raymond Brown and his hefty two volumes, The Death of the Messiah, can help us come to some certainty on this. At the end of his lengthy discussion, Brown quotes the late second century bishop of, bishop of great authority, Melito of Sardis, who wrote, Jesus' body naked and not even deemed worthy of a clothing that it might not be seen. Therefore the heavenly lights turned away and the day darkened in order that he might be hidden who was denuded upon the cross. Still, Brown makes this conclusion. I would judge, he writes, that there is no way to settle the question even if the evidence favors complete despoliation, complete nudity. We cannot know for sure. Well, does it matter? What would that mean for our theology? Just to start with, I think it could lead to a deeper understanding of the biblical theme of the first and second Adam, as we further explore the parallels related to nudity and covering of each. There are some Christians who think that, and I quote, Jesus willingly experienced the depth of human sin through public nakedness, so we could experience freedom from shame as he bore all of our sexual failures on the cross, end of the quote. I understand that this connection would be meaningful to some, but I am uncomfortable with approaching Jesus' suffering in such a fragmentary manner, like his redemptive work is a spa package. This part covers this human problem, this kind of suffering, that. 
the comprehensiveness of our redemption cannot depend on one loincloth. Certainly, I don't think that our theological systems stand or fall on the existence of an undergarment. So what do we conclude about this then? How is our faith informed by contemplation of this question? There is no doubt whatsoever that when Jesus finally died, the purpose ascribed to the Roman crucifixion that I discussed earlier was fully accomplished. Whether there remained a loincloth or not, there was no dignity left. The mission of total degradation was fulfilled. But what makes this so remarkable is that God added another most important layer of degradation to this process, taking on the human form in the first place. The divinity doesn't mix with any of it, but it did. Even that initial slap on the cheek of Jesus delivered by a Jewish leader should take our breath away. The tree and God became incarnate at that time in history when such an act of killing was carried out with a thoroughly dehumanizing intent and practice. So that even that humanity that Jesus took on he lost by the end of the process. And by losing it, he regained for us our proper image-bearing humanity as he clothed us in righteousness. Less than a decade after Christ's crucifixion, the fourth emperor of Rome was installed, Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus. Seneca wrote that this Caesar fully dedicated himself to the world he ruled, that he robbed himself of himself to become a balm for his people's wounds. And a mere sight of his divinity would dry his people's teary eyes. In honor of his, this Caesar's leadership, songs and hymns of praise would be composed and publicly performed. In an ultimate hold my beer move, the, at the same time, the first Christians had the audacity to write and proclaim their own hymn to their Lord. The words probably go back to the early 60s of the first century when this was likely widely recited as a creed or sung as a hymn and then made its way into Paul's letter. The hymn captures for us the essence of this degradation, this stripping process in a hauntingly beautiful and revealing wording in Philippians 2. Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 